Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, or good more after for short. Sure. Hope you're having a good one. In this video, we're going to look at healthy masculinity and monk mode. There's different degrees of monk mode. It's not an on-off switch. Some men go minimalist and they reduce the amount of stuff they've got because they decide they want more freedom and more time in their life to pursue other goals other than, than work. Uh, some men have monk mode forced upon them, maybe through a divorce that's left them short of money. Some men choose monk mode because they're doing, as uh, Richard Cooper might say, they're, they're choosing to chase excellence rather than to chase women. It's a, re a really interesting topic, so let's get into it. Monk mode comes out in, in many ways in a man's life from a minor change to a complete renunciation of the life they had before. How this monk mode expresses in somebody's life depends pretty much on the type of society they're living in and their own inclinations. And uh, in Western countries and secular societies, monk mode tends to come out in a secular way, in a, in a not particularly religious way. In religious societies, monk mode tends to come out in a religious way. In a, in a secular, mainstream way, the impulse of monk mode may be expressed in a, a bachelor lifestyle, choosing to be unencumbered, so how we say, with certain social ties and obligations, and choosing to remain free of those. And in a more religious or spiritual version of it, it's, the man may seek freedom from, from the world, from material things, and seek inner goals to seek spiritual awakening or some form of enlightenment or simply decide that their main priority is peace of mind rather than getting stuff <laughs> and accumulating stuff. However, the, the phenomenon of, of monk mode is much wider than we may suspect. In India, there are five million wandering monks, some of whom can look very odd and even alien to a Westerner. And you might wonder, well, what's this got to do with monk mode in the West? But if we look deeper, we see there is a connection, there is a relationship. For example, this gentleman might have been just a year or two before, been the head of a, of a large computer support company. And this other gentleman, he might have been the owner of a chain of jewellery shops. This man here might have been very recently, you know, a farmer all of his life up until this point. You see a lot of the monks in India, they're fairly old. It's like because they've been through life, spent a bit of time in India. And they call it the path of the householder. They get married and have a family. But afterwards, they want something else. They want something more. Usually they find themselves a teacher or a guru and who helps them with their, their spiritual development. So that's what a lot of these men have done. They've had the phase of the householder. And it's interesting that in the West, many men are facing a same, similar experience to the monks in India, but it's been forced upon them. It's been forced upon them by divorce and having to renounce a lot of the material gains through divorce. So we could say in a way that these, these wandering monks in India, and as I say this, but oh, four or five million, depending on the estimates. And in a sense, they're, they're choosing to go their own way. They do tend to find a teacher or a guru to help them, but that somewhat happens and um, in the West as well, men, if they decide to go their own way, usually will find uh, influencers to help them. So you could argue in a way that these men are somewhat going their own way, though it's the, their version for their culture, for their religious background, because they've got a very strong religious background in India. There's a lot of monks in Thailand, there's hundreds of thousands of monks in Thailand. Now the peculiar thing about that is that a lot of these monks are actually part-time. <laughs> Or they're temporarily monks. <laughs> they're not monks all the time. They might, they might be a monk for a few weeks or a few months, or they might be monks at the weekends or every, every so often. So not every monk you see in Thailand is permanently a monk. <laughs> in fact, um, for, for quite a while it's been seen as a rite of passage for young men to become a monk for a while, particularly just before they get married. It's interesting that in Thailand that one of the things they see as a good preparation for marriage is a, is a male to spend time being celibate and deny the pleasures of life. Make of that what you will. But it's interesting that they see that as <laughs> good preparation for marriage. 
<laughs> also, of course, big part of being coming a monk is learning to beg because they part of the ritual is that you go out in the mornings and they, they beg for food. So, and uh, it's a good preparation for marriage. Okay. <laughs> it's very different from the Disney pers perspective of marriage. So um, maybe the ties have got a more realistic perspective on marriage than we have. You decide for yourself <laughs> which is the closest to the reality of marriage and which is the best preparation <laughs> for the realities of marriage. The Western style of uh, being inculcated with the, with the Disney version of a dream come true forever fairy story romance, or <laughs> the Thai approach where, where the man becomes a monk, goes celibate, denies himself the pleasures of life for a while, and actually has to beg for food as part of the ritual of being a monk. The monk and Paul been active throughout history and in different cultures and different social systems. How it expresses itself depends on that social system. It depends on the religion and the social structure of that society. In the West, we see the growth of MGTOW, men going their own way, which, and the growth of the manosphere, which is like an informal brotherhood, you might say, of men who help each other through the, the vagaries and challenges of life, and uh, particularly the challenge of divorce, which is what brings a lot of men into into the manosphere and into monk mode. Many modern men are discovering that there are elements of monk mode which help them in deep and profound ways and help them navigate through life. There's an element of monk mode which has to do with discipline, uh, learning to get some kind of control of life and, and the needs and drives of the body. Being able to have some kind of discipline around that area can really help liberate us from the things and the people that would ensnare us with their agendas. You know, some of the agendas of society are in the greater interest of society, but they're not always in the interest of that particular individual. And being able to have freedom of choice about what we get ensnared with and what we don't get ensnared with is, can be a good thing. We might choose to be a new form of bachelor, such as a better bachelor or a casual bachelor. We might choose to go minimalist and free ourselves from obligations so we can spend less time working and more time doing the things we love to do, whatever those are. We might choose to chase excellence rather than chase women, as, as Richard Cooper likes to say. We might choose to focus more on our health and well-being and, and get fresh and fit. Or we might just choose to be in a, a normal job, in a normal situation, and ghost our way through and dodge potential bullets that, the, that maybe come our way as we navigate through the matrix. In India, the, the monks there tend to have a guru or a teacher who guides them. In the West, there's an equivalent because most people who are, who are open to monk mode tend to follow more than one influencer and, and pick and mix between the influencers they come across. And feel free to, in the comments to add any particular influencers that that you really get a lot from and but please also say why you recommend them that would be really helpful to others who come across this although i might name a few influencers along the way i don't necessarily recommend any specific influencers because for one thing they might change and by the time you hear this i may be completely on to something else so uh, what i would recommend to not buy into any of the divisions and schisms that are tending to happen somewhat on the manosphere in general. Because in any social phenomenon, ultimately there's this point arises where it begins to divide into different different factions and schisms and um, and it can be easy to get pulled one way or another, especially if you're interested in an influencer who is into one particular faction, one particular aspect of that. And why this is important is a lot of men who come into to the manosphere are doing it in a stage of red pill rage. They're really angry about the divorce, and that's perfectly understandable. I know how that feels. I've, I've been there. I still, I still sometimes get twinges of it myself. So, However, that's not a good basis for making deep decisions about life. It's in a state of anger and rage, and it's, it's very tempting to give your allegiance then to other men who are angry <laughs> and raging. <laughs> However, that's not really where our allegiance needs to go. Your allegiance needs to be with what's your values 
It needs to be with what's the highest and best within yourself. What is really important to you? And the job of an influencer is really to help awaken the highest and best within you so you can follow that. You transfer your allegiance to the highest and best within yourself. That's your guide. That's your ultimate teacher. Is that, that's what tells you that's right and wrong for you. Your rage won't do it. Somebody else's rage won't do it. Only the highest and best within yourself can guide you through your life. And most of us at one stage in life got too busy um, having a family, chasing women. To, we went through the stage of life, the stage of the household, or as they call it in India, where maybe chasing success in various ways. And that's okay. That's a part of the process of life. But then it reaches a point where it's ultimately not satisfying. And many men, end, um, even when they were happily married, they were, they were being stoic and struggling in a job that maybe they really didn't like very much for the sake of the family. So that's what the aspect of divorce that becomes a liberation if, if the man has enough income to, you know, depending on what happens with the guy's income through the divorce process, um, he can have gained a certain amount of freedom. Um, that's why divorce can be a liberation. That um, It can be very painful, I agree, and it can also be a liberation in some ways too. Because then it is a time to find out, well, what do you really value? You're on your own, in a sense. Um, you can cultivate connections within the manosphere. You can cultivate connections with other men, whatever. But what do you really value that is worth living by? If you got to the end of your life and you were looking back on it, what would be really important that you would have achieved or done? How would you like to have lived? What values were really important to you to express? The job of influence is to help you discover those in yourself. Then you run with them. And then you stay with the influences to help you move deeper into an understanding of the highest and best within yourself. And you cultivate that and move on that. And if an influencer is just encouraging you to be raging and angry and is forever showing clips of this crazy lady does this and this crazy woman did that, it's not going to take you there. I mean, it's, it's, it can be really funny. <laughs> it can be fun for a while. Um, but if it just keeps us stuck on a kind of raging resentment thing, it's not going to lead you to the highest and best within you. And it's certainly not going to lead you to peace of mind. And in the long term, isn't that what we want? Is some kind of peace of mind. Is you check how the influencers are influencing you. And in the long term, is it bringing out the best in you and helping you discover and express that? Or is it taking you away from it? Because you don't want to have anything to do with anything that's taking you away from that. Till you find what's gold in you, what's, what makes you feel good about you and being you. And anger and bitterness won't do that. So we need to move on from the rage stage. <laughs> I'm not down on these influencers because everybody has their role, even the ones that are still into the rage stage because everybody has their role. And one of the role of influencers is to help bring out the rage in men um, because it needs to come out in order to let it go. The thing is to bring it out in constructive ways. Then we can let it go and get past it. And so they're doing a very necessary job. It needs to be done to burst the bubble of the illusion of romantic love. The whole marriage romance thing, having videos that address the, the aspects of the other gender that are not sugar and spice and all things nice. To have an ongoing reminder of that was sometimes helpful to, to, and sometimes really funny to see the hidden side of the other gender. And um, so, so it has its place. You know, it's, it's a matter of how much of it you get and not to get lost in that but to reach out for, the, um, for something more nourishing, but also look out for influences that do trigger the nobler qualities within yourself, not just the ones that help you get your, your rage out. <laughs> Though, of course, it's a necessary stage. So you can find healthy and valid purpose in life, move beyond the life that you lived before, and move beyond being the person you lived before, because you'll discover there's much more to you than you realize because you are busy being a certain type of person. Uh, and the thing is to, dis is to find influence that will help you discover what this more is. <laughs>
in essence, that's partly what monk mode is about. It's about having time and space in your life to discover the highest and best within yourself and to be more and more follow the direction that that part of you takes you in. This higher and better part of you is good, but it's not necessarily nice. So you may be concerned, well, if I look to a kind of nobler part of myself, I might end up as a nice guy. But that's not actually true. But a man who's a nice guy is not really in integrity. He's not being fully himself. And he's in denial of aspects of himself, usually, and disempowers himself. Whereas this nobler and higher aspect of yourself is good, which means it's also not nice. But it'll do the right thing even when it's not the nice thing. Whereas a nice guy will do the nice thing even if it's the wrong thing. The highest and best within you will lead you to do the right thing even if it's not the nice thing. And it will lead you to speak the right thing even if it's not the nice thing. So there's a fire in the belly. Of, uh, of the good part of yourself. There's no fire in the belly of the nice part of yourself. So it's a, an empowering way to be. So whatever you do about monk mode and whatever ways you want to apply it to your life, however deeply you want to go into it, make sure it's your way of doing it. And be you, be your best, be your best self. You're awesome. Go for it.